I would like to introduce our next guest. She is amazing and she's a very good friend of mine. But other than that and more than that, she is an athlete, a boxer, an actress, a coach, a Buddhist. I'd like to introduce you to Lucia Riker. Hi, Lucia. Hey. Hey, Ollie. It's been a long time. I know it has. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, Honestly, because because True Beauty Discovery is the nonprofit that that I founded and and it's part of this speaking series, one of the explorations for me has been to kind of look into what beauty is all about, what femininity is all about, what any of it means. And for me, one of the things about you that has always struck me is you kind of epitomize the modern woman or the woman, you know, the woman that that I would have loved my daughter to look up to as she grew up. I think you, you, and, and and there are so many things about you. It's like, you're kind of, there's opposites about you that are so, you were called the most dangerous woman in the world. And yet you're one of the most gentle human beings I've ever met. So it's, there's just these, these opposites. So just, I just wonder, you know, what your ideas are about femininity and beauty. Maybe we start off with that. What is beauty? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. To me, beauty is a person in its potential. Whatever that means, you're a gardener, you're an athlete, whatever you're doing, when you're in the flow of your potential, you're beautiful. Everyone's beautiful. I once looked at uh, diving because I did a show where I had to prepare to become a diver. So I looked at divers and every diver that stood on the side ready to jump had the most beautiful body. And I thought, there's not a selection on bodies for divers because it's about the action that they perform, right? So the body is in its fullest potential when they stand there for a competition, whether it is a long distance runner, um, track and field, it doesn't matter. And that's in life also, when you're in your potential, you're beautiful. So that's beauty to me. Then personally on a symmetric level, I like beauty on a symmetric level. When things are balanced, that's my personal view of beauty. When things are symmetrical and feng shui, so they feel good, that is beauty to me also. So I think, again, beauty is so personal. You know, some, like like you mentioned earlier, I can be extremely this and extremely that. And in order for me to be extremely gentle, I had to learn also to acknowledge the extreme animal in me, right? If I didn't let the animal out, I I couldn't be that gentle. It would always be kind of in the middle. Was it hard to find that? Because when, you know, when I've, I mean, I've known you since you're, you, you've still been boxing, but you've sort of transitioned a little. I didn't know you at the time when, you know, when I've read about you, when when you were so angry, you talked about it. You you you, it was a lot of rage there. I mean, was that hard to come to terms with? You know, when you start young as an athlete, you 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 don't know that you have rage. It's just fuel for, for performance, right? You could become a successful business owner, a politician, and have tremendous rage and be driven by it in a very subtle way you notice it when you retire or when there's a transition when things fall apart your business falls apart whatever you identified with falls away then you come to deeper layers of what was your drive to be seen and and acknowledged or respected and there comes the healing um so the outlet is great. And then, then to start looking underneath the pain, because rage is pain. You know, like Mike Tyson just has a series out. And when I see him in the beginning, I'm like, oh, whoa, what a wounded man. And um, But he's also extremely gentle. 
right? And then I lost your question. I'm sorry. It's just I, I just was asking about um, you know kind of coming to terms with the the rage that initially it, you know I think in terms of you as a boxer and yeah. your sport. I think that there was probably, I don't know, because because I don't box, but I think there there was probably a lot of, uh, it's violent, right? You know, yeah, that's, what's your, in, what's your definition of violence? Physical, may, perhaps, like in terms of that, it's physical pain, physical, um, like football's violent, not soccer. So, but giving birth is that violence? I don't know. Maybe yes, and no. Oh, so <laughs> so to me, like to me, it was an art, and that I needed that focused anger, rage, whatever you call it, focused into my gift as an athlete. I made it an art. To me, it was an art, like I polished it and polished it. And if I could be in the flow and I could be aligned mentally, physically and spiritually, things would go naturally. And I, all I did was train, 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 train. I would watch my diet either fast or let go of sugar and all the, you know, uh, preservatives and, and, and the, uh, how do you say that? Yeah anything that's not natural. Then I would go into silent retreats so I could really connect with my inner voice. That was part of what made me a great athlete. Yes, I was athletic and I had an athletic ability and a gift, but that I aligned all of it, that made me a champion. Oh, that's so amazing. And that's so cool. Do you think, I mean, sports right now for women and girls, do you think, uh, where do you think we are with that? I mean, we're in a better place than we were 20 years ago, but. Um, well, if you say where, where we're at, uh, it's all perspective. Where are we at compared to what? Um, what is our vision? I always think freedom is, is, is the goal. Freedom to do what you enjoy as a woman, as a man, as a person. Um, yeah, equality. Now we're still working on it because it takes time to change the consciousness of people. And I remember in the time where I was uh, boxing with men that related to me like their mother or their sister didn't acknowledge me until I gave them a bloody nose. And then I said, I'm not your sister or your mother. I am uh, a colleague. A uh, boxer, athlete that works as hard, if not harder than you. Um, and then they had to learn to build a new relating to a female that was in the same field as they were. And that takes time. So collectively, we are, you know, compared to some countries, we're very far. And then yet, do we believe as women to be seen and treated as equal? Or do we still sell out? Because it starts also with us. If we believe we're worthy, then we will become worthy. Because collectively, I remember when women's boxing was not yet in the Olympics. And I started giving workshops and to mainly female athletes. And I spoke to their coaches. And I said, if we believe it, it will manifest. In what was it? We were aiming for 2008 and then 2012. And I said, well, keep believing because at some point there's a tipping point of believing and then it will manifest. So, and that goes simultaneously in countries all over the world. When we believe we're worthy, not from anger and entitlement, but just from that we're worthy. And not that we need to compare, but that we hold our own. And whatever we do, whatever that is in our potential, is worthy of being recognized, respected, and also compensated for. And if we believe that, it will manifest. And that takes time because it takes time to change the collective consciousness. I remember the time when I was an athlete, a female boxer, people thought I was a bit nuts. So I had to dress up really nice, do my hair and look all relatable. 
because in the ring, I was an animal. Now, nine out of 10 women does some kickbox aerobics, some type of self-defense, some type of activity. They have gloves in the back of the trunk. It's hip and it's normal. I have flight attendants come to me and they're like, oh my God, I kickbox. It's so amazing. It's so therapeutic. I feel so empowered. And I'm like, I used to say that and nobody listened to me. And now they come to me and, and try to inspire me how wonderful kickboxing is or combat sports. And I'm like, uh-huh. But back in the day, I was an animal and people didn't want much to do with me because, oh my God, that is so barbaric. Well, it's the best therapeutic sport out there to release, to empower, to connect, to learn, to use your senses. Like these days, we're so dis disconnected. We're only on the computer or we're hooked on the phone. We're no longer in our senses. It's needed. It's needed for every boy and girl to do some type of combat sport, whether it's capoeira, where you learn to be in your senses, whether it's kickboxing, when you learn to stand for yourself, or whether it's grappling or even MMA, you know, it's a combination of things. And of course, on a professional level, we could have a discussion because it's not for everyone. But on a, on a recreational level, combat sports, and on a therapeutic level, every man should do jujitsu. Every man should smell another man and measure physically, feel another man. Because we're afraid. Men are afraid of men. But it's so healthy for men to be close to other men and to feel again. Because nine out of ten jobs for men are behind the computer. That's so unhealthy to just be working with the mind. And then they go to the gym on a treadmill while with a headset on watching TV. Where are our senses, our intuition? Where is that natural need to connect with your senses? It's gone. What do you do? So, okay, so tell me in terms of you, like, well, I know, are you still training? Do you still, like, what, what's your, where are you with that? Well, I've for, for the last two and a half years, I did a lot of inner work because I was in the forest. Um, I wanted to understand what was happening in the world, which I couldn't because there was an information war going on. And when there's an information war, everything reminds me of combat. An information war is the marketing machine of the opponent says this and the marketing machine of your team says that right? What is the truth? Nobody really knows. The marketing machine that produces, that has the most funding, that produces the most, uh, 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 that has the biggest uh, viewers, will has the, mo has the most power, right? It's the most believable. This guy's going to win. Yeah, he's really strong. But what's the truth? The truth lies within us knowing and sensing, and we lost it. So I compare everything to boxing. If I see um, a presidential election and the whole race, I see a, a boxing match, marketing machine, calling one another out, calling on each other's weaknesses and that hole and that hole and that guy's full of shit and he's never this and that. And that's boxing again. That's how I viewed the world. And I thought, okay, I have to go where I am, um, where I've relied on the most, which is my senses. So I went to the forest, chopping wood, carrying water. So in being in my senses, I start to feel what is right and what is wrong in the craziness of the fear that was running the world, right? So um, coming out of that, coming back to America, I mean, I did some Tai Chi and standing meditation. I taught uh, online workshops. I did two... Uh, Troubled Youth series. Called it's, that's School. called Dream School, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful event. In the lockdown, we had a group uh, in a bubble. They call it a bubble. Everybody gets tested uh, twice to make sure that nobody carried in anything. And that uh, within the bubble, we could create our own reality. We could hug one another. The kids were so happy that somebody was connecting with them because they were locked in their apartment, behind their computer, in this craziness, right? 
So that I did. And then I just got back to LA and then I thought, okay, it's time to get my physical groove back. So I started on the bicycle because I was at some health challenges. I had a, a cyst on, in my hip joint pushing on a nerve, which made my life a bit hell, I have to say. Um, but then again, I go to a silence. I did three silence retreats and I cured it. So, you know, they couldn't get to it. The medical field couldn't get to it because that opened my hip, which is quite big surgery. And I'm like, okay, hold on. Let's see what I can do. I changed my food. I went on uh, mainly uh, living foods and I went into silence and then I beat it. So, yeah, I'm I'm still a stranger when it comes down to well-being and life. I still am the athlete. I draw from uh, my knowledge as a fighter to know, to follow, follow my senses and to know when to do what, because we're all guided. We just lost the connection. Yeah. Um, you were called the most dangerous woman in the world. Yes, I was at some point, yes. Yes. That's, and that's quite a title. It's quite, a, it's quite a, an armor, because the moment you get a title, you're stuck. Because then you have to live up to it, right? If you're called the most dangerous woman in, uh, on earth, what does that mean? Mm, that means that you better, you better be powerful. You better not show vulnerability. You better be on top of your game all the time. You better, there's a lot that comes with it, but I'm also human and I'm a woman at the same time. So I had to let go of the armor. You know, every every time you build a title of some sort, you have to be willing to destroy it. Whether it is the most dangerous woman on earth, whether it is the Buddhist, whether it is the boxer, whatever it is, you have to destroy it. And then you come back again to who you are, who I am again and again. Right. So it's a nice journey. Uh, the armor of the most dangerous woman in the world just like being a great champion, it takes quite some work to de-armor uh, and to acknowledge the human being that was trapped in the armor to free her. And that, that feels really good. Does it take a long time? It's a it's, it's gradual process. You know, it takes yeah. over time. It's gradually built, you know, be becoming a champion is gradually built, becoming that identity. And then when you feel you get stuck in it, it's like, oh, hold, hold on. Ooh, this is a, then it's time to de-armor. And that's a slow process of awakening. You know, a chanting Nam Yo Renge Kyo was one of a slow process of awakening. And it's like having worldly desires and at the same time, enlightenment happens so you wake up at the same time i have a big breakthrough um, a big movie recognized and boom my father has cancer boom i have a big uh, uh, event making history as a female fighter fighting for a million dollars oh my mom uh, dies right first she got a stroke then she dies so or i'd come from a award-winning movie and i go to a buddhist meeting and i'm in a group with women that couldn't pay for the food of their children and i was like okay this is reality check right like that is important to always balance to not get stuck in our own group of people with like-minded people but to connect with all kinds of people and that's what buddhism helped me to do how long have you been a buddhist when did well i never say i am a buddhist i always say i practice so i when did that come into your life I started practicing in 1993. I was introduced by uh, one of my students. She was from England. And then I remember a time when I I had, um, I was in, an, in a toxic relating with my trainer. And uh, at some point I thought it's enough. It's enough of abuse. And I wanted to hurt him. And as I was ready to hurt him, some part of me thought, try this Buddhism. So I turned my car around. I drove to this Buddhist meeting and I said, teach me about whatever you're doing, this box, 
with this thing, this paper scroll, scroll in it. And I start chanting. And within, and I said, okay, if I still want to hurt this guy, I'll do it in a week. But let me see. And it worked. I awakened. I thought, oh, I am responsible for my own actions. Oh, I can create my own reality. Oh, I can actually change the situation when I'm in. I'm not dependent on him and what he does because he was a very powerful man. And I start chanting and I changed so much. I moved to America within six months. I had to start all over. I chanted for my papers. I chanted to become the best female fighter in the world. God, I chanted to transform and heal my life because there was a lot of work to be done after, you know, abuse for a long time. Um, and slowly and gradually, I started to heal. And it's a lifelong journey to heal, especially when you have some deep traumas. Um, I gave a lot of trainings. I took a lot of trainings. I lived in a, a commune for a little bit. I taught uh, martial arts and personal transformation. I call it bio biofeedback, like through movement to get in touch with your traumas and with your fears and reprogram yourself and empower yourself in a very gentle way to be aware when you hit from where do you hit do you hit to hurt are you aware of your opponent in the interaction like so many things that i have learned over the years by just reflecting and personal transformation work and healing that i've done that i now give back into the world in my workshops and in my lectures um yeah, to heal others, to help others to heal themselves. Do you train? Do you train people anymore? Do you train? Are you thinking about doing that at all again? Or are you, I know you worked with Diane. Diane. Yes, yeah, I worked with Diane. I shot a film, Bittersweet with Diane, which was a very powerful film, but also a tragedy. I and read about that. Can you, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It, that was part of my awakening also. I remember when I came out of that fight and I was very invested in winning because in certain, in entertainment, let's let's keep it general, when there's money involved and where there's investments, there's always manipulation, right? So I felt that we were the underdog. And at some point I felt we were mistreated. So I was very invested in winning by knockout. So the moment we win by knockout, I see that something happens to this girl. After 10 seconds of joy, I saw something was wrong. So I, I, I noticed it. And I asked for the paramedic. We put the lady into a stretcher and she ends up in a coma. She had a um, stroke during the fight after the knockout. So, and I held her and she was moaning and the moaning went to my soul so i remember i afterwards i went to, we were shooting a documentary also and i asked to see the footage and when i heard the moaning again it shocked me and i walked the streets i went out grabbed my jacket i walked the streets in stockholm because the fight was in sweden and i screamed to god and i cried and i said god did you really give me this gift to hurt people, to put people in a wheelchair, to put a single mom in a wheelchair, really? And I yelled at God and asked God to show me why I have this gift, right? And that was one of my awakenings. I have this gift to empower and to inspire, not to destroy. Even though I have the ability to do so, I saw my ability in action and I thought, no, this cannot be true. So I did two more fights with Diane where two fights later, I was at the bottom of Diane's bed, waking her up every hour, wondering if she would wake up. And then I said, that's it, that's enough. And I start fully going into teaching workshops and teaching one-on-one -on -one coaching and speaking to inspire and to empower because that is why I have my gift. So it was all part of the awakening process. You know, and Did sometimes... you... Was it weird to you? I mean, that's kind of, it's, it sounds like Million Dollar Baby. It sort of does sound like the script to Million Dollar Baby. That must have been kind of strange to live that out and 
a way that no, wasn't... I had actually flashback of that movie when that happened. I'm sure you did. Yeah, and oh, I get the chill on on my on my left side when you talk about it. You know, I've been guilty of that, right? When we want to feel superior, when we knock someone else down, right? Because only then we feel great. That in a moment where you knock someone down that is suffering, which is not the intention. The intention is to win. But knocking people out or down or hurting is part of the game. And I didn't want Diane to raise her um, belt. I wanted her to wait until Frida would come out of her coma. And that's kind of sad, right? You should be able to lift it because you won. But somehow it didn't feel right to feel the glory at the expense of someone else's life. So, you know, those things, part of the game, right? Part of the sport. But when it happens to you and you feel it in your soul, then something happens and it's irreversible. So that is part of the process of awakening. At some point, certain things you can no longer do because you become sensitive to the suffering of other human beings. And then you just want to heal and give back. Comes also with growing older, even though there's a lot of coaches out there that still go for the glory and the victory, which is nothing wrong with it. You know, that that is perfect. Sports are beautiful and I love sports. But for me, it was time to transition into something else that would fit me better. Um, Diane's still fighting. Yes. Uh, she has, she had a break for three years yeah. after um, her last fight. She made a comeback, I thought this year or the or last year, and she's preparing for another fight. And uh, not with me because I, I uh, yeah, I don't want to be responsible. For, I love Diane and I want her to have a long life and she is um, she has a great job. She's uh, an IT specialist. So she needs her brain also. So I'd hope that after this last fight, which will be in uh, Croatia, if I'm not mistaken, that she'll retire. Because Diane Prezik is how you say her name. Yes. Yes. Um, any advice you'd give to, I mean, I know that's, but but to a young girl who's looking to be an athlete or to anything you'd say to her, anything you'd say to your younger self, you know, that. that whatever person. you do, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. And know that even you you love what you do, you will bump into obstacles. That is part of it. So it's not always fun. So do it wholeheartedly. It's not always fun. Obstacles are there to make you a better athlete or performer or whatever your um, art is. Because yeah? everything is kind of an art. I believe so. It is wood on the, on the fire. You know, obstacles are wood on the fire to make you a better performer, a better athlete, a better person. And if you frame it like that, nothing can stop you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I look forward to many more conversations with you and seeing where you land, as always.